I want to start off by telling you about uh, one of the best weekends of my life. Uh, it was near the end of college, sort of a last hurrah with some of the friends that I uh, worked on the school literary journal with. And uh, I went to college in the Pacific Northwest. One of my friends had a beach house up on Hood Canal, which is an area north of Seattle. And out in front of this beach house was a, an oyster bed, an enormous oyster bed. And at the first low tide, which was at about 2 in the morning, after uh, you know, being there and, and sort of imbibing in beverages all night, we all went out and took five-gallon pails and harvested as many oysters as, as we could. And for the rest of the weekend, anytime we were hungry, we would pop open a few oysters or throw some on the grill and let them steam open. And we spent our whole weekend uh, drinking delicious beer and eating delicious oysters. And uh, it really stands out still for me as a, as a great weekend, uh, hard to match. Uh, one of the reasons it's hard to match is because I live in Colorado now. And <laughs> oysters are a coastal delicacy, right? Uh, here, we have Rocky Mountain oysters. <laughs> They're a little less pride of the sea and a little more pride of the herd. And uh, we apparently love them enough to put them in beer sometimes. Uh, this is Wine Coop's uh, Rocky Mountain Oyster Stat. You can get it just up the road here. And uh, I have tried it. It has an aftertaste that I would describe as tangy. Um, <laughs> it's also a preview. Next year, I hope to be talking to you about the history of beer in Colorado. Um, but uh, you know, I knew about Rocky Mountain oysters. But in the course of doing some research for that book, A Ditch in Time, which is a, a history of water in Denver, um, and w for which I had many questions about the price of water in Denver, uh, I kept coming across ads, uh, ads for oysters. Um, and it turns out that the original Rocky Mountain oysters were, in fact, oysters. Uh, they were nearly 1,700 miles from Baltimore, which was the hub of the oyster industry in, uh, around the Chesapeake Bay in the 19th century. But oysters, canned and fresh, roasted, raw, cooked, smoked, um, almost every variety were common in Colorado from almost the very beginning of the gold rush in 1859. Uh, primary sources really testify to their prominence. Like I said, I came across them through ads. This is just a sampling of ads that I pulled off of the Colorado Historic Newspaper Archive. Um, they represent ads from Denver, Aspen, Central City, Dolores, Leadville, Georgetown, all between 1860 and the 1880s. Uh, by 1874, the oyster trade in Denver was so significant that the local press was taking note. Uh, I don't know how well you can see it, but it says uh, a dozen, half, a dozen cases, no, 60 to 75 cases arriving each week. Uh, the wholesale value of the cases is about $35. This is in Denver. $35 in 1874 is about $880 today. There were a lot of oysters being distributed uh, throughout Colorado. Um, here are a few places you might have encountered oysters if you lived in Colorado in the 1880s. Uh, this is Pearl Street, ever chic, uh, Pearl Street Boulder in, uh, in the 1880s. Um, and uh, if you look very closely on the left there, you will see that those, that store right there is selling what they advertise as fresh oysters. <laughs> um, it wasn't just the front range. This is Main Street Gunnison in 1881. And if you could see on the left-hand side about midway down, uh, this is the Oyster Depot, where New York and Baltimore oysters are received daily. Um, through the miracle of the railroad, uh, they probably could receive them daily or at least every couple of days, and who's going to know the difference? In, 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 in. Uh, and even a place like Cripple Creek in 1892, uh, this tent is euphemistically labeled a lunchroom, and you can see, uh, you can't see unless I show you, on the bottom left, they are offering oysters short for 70 cents. I don't know about you, but I would not eat oysters from a place <laughs> that looked like that. But people did. Uh, this is a menu from Georgetown, the Hotel de Paris. And uh, you can see the whole right-hand side of the menu is devoted to oysters. You can get a half dozen raw oysters in the 1880s in Georgetown for 35 cents. 
uh, with inflation that equals about $8.80 today. That's a great deal. Downtown right now, the half dozens I was seeing were $16 and up. Uh, although to be fair, at happy hour at Jack's you can get a half dozen for $7.50. Um, <laughs> And uh, if you couldn't make it into a restaurant, this is actually a very popular miner's handbook from 1859. A lot of people took this with them when they went prospecting. And it's got a packing list, you know, dried apples, 100 pounds, uh, four good rifles. And then in the, the last category here, luxuries, 12 cans of oysters, Maltby's best, $15, which equals $380 in today's prices. That's a significant investment in having oysters at your campsite in the middle of the mountains. Okay, so you may wonder, why am I talking about <laughs> oysters in Colorado to you today? Um, well, the answer is I'm, I'm not, or I'm not just talking to you about oysters in Colorado. Um, the story of oysters in Colorado is really the story of westward expansion. Uh, one of many examples of Americans moving west and carrying East Coast and European sensibilities with them that seemed out of place in the West. Uh, it's the story of the development of transportation networks. Here we see oysters being loaded off the wharves in Baltimore, loaded onto a wagon. This wagon would go to a train. This train would go to the end of the line, uh, wherever its destination was. An oyster packed on ice could be saleable for a couple of weeks after it was pulled out of the water. So they got these oysters all over the West uh, very quickly through the development of transportation networks. It's a story of how cities made use of their natural resources. This again is the oyster fleet in Baltimore. Uh, Baltimore was a very prosperous city, I'm sure you know, in uh, the 19th century. Um, and if you know Baltimore today, you know that this is also a story of the economic ascension and declension of cities. And, and how that can be tied in part to natural resources. Uh, it's a story of technological advances in industrialization. Uh, oysters were one of the first foods to be canned and, and canned for shipping. That's an early oyster can, courtesy of the Library of Congress. Uh, and industrialization, you can see the enormous shell pile here uh, on the bottom right. And the flip side of that story, of course, it's a story of environmental consequences, the Chesapeake Bay hosts nowhere near the number of oysters that uh, ecologists estimate it used to. Finally, it's a story of labor systems, and particularly, heartbreakingly, it's a story of child labor. Uh, many of the great oyster houses on the East Coast employed children. In this, these pictures on the left, you see a seven-year-old shucking, a six-year-old shucking, an 11-year-old shucking. On the right, you see a little Rosie Burdick um, shucking in South Carolina. She's seven years old at the time. She shucked three buckets a day instead of going to school. Uh, these pictures are courtesy of a muckraking journalist who went out and took pictures of child laborers in the oyster houses. Um, and you, can, you get a lot more stories, many more stories, uh, when you start with oysters in Colorado. Uh, all stories that are usually addressed from an eastern perspective. Uh, stories that happen 2,000 miles away from where we are. And uh, you know, isn't it cool when we can connect that kind of a story to something that happened where we are today? It becomes much more relatable when you can serve it up on a half shell in Colorado rather than talking about it as something that happened over there in a place where your students may or may not have ever been. So the world is... The world is our oyster. We can, we can make an oyster story out of anything, I would say. Uh, with the right telescoping lens, you can go from one story to another story and find the connections. We live in an interconnected world. We all know this. Um, but history works best when it starts at home. And we know this, too. We all begin from our own experiences. Uh, that's the framework for how we shape our understanding of the world and how our students shape their understanding of the world. And education, I would suggest both formal education and informal education, uh, one definition would be the process of constructing that framework for how we understand the world, and thus for how we understand our place in the world. 
and how we become citizens of our communities and how we choose how we are going to engage with our lives. I want to close by introducing a, a tool that uh, my partners and I have been working on um, and a tool that I hope will uh, guide teachers in that process that will help provide that telescoping lens to connect Colorado stories to other stories that we have to teach when we're, when we're um, teaching to standards in Colorado. Uh, and then I'm going to na shamelessly name drop uh, three prominent endorsers of our efforts. Um, so first, the tool. Primary source sets. It's very similar to something you're all familiar with thanks to the great work of TPS, annotated resource sets. Um, I'm, I'm a shameless guy. I'm shamelessly stealing this basically from them with the slight change that the ones we're making, I think, have a stronger narrative thread because they're a creation, they're a collaborative creation between subject matter experts um, at universities, at museums, uh, and classroom teachers. We bring uh, people with subject matter expertise together with teachers who know how it can be used in a classroom. And we create uh, these tools. Um, just briefly, there's a background section giving you some, a brief overview of the topic. In this case, uh, I've got Japanese imprisonment at Amache. Uh, that is the pilot that we are developing right now. Uh, we're getting ready to show it to some teachers and find out how well we've done with our subject matter experts. Uh, there's a section on standards alignment, so it's easy to see how these can help you teach to the standards that you have to meet in a classroom. Then come the primary sources with annotations, again, prepared by the subject matter experts. And then come some teacher resources developed by classroom teachers for classroom teachers. Uh, they are standards aligned uh, and grade appropriate. In the beginning, we're targeting fourth, eighth, and high school, fourth grade, eighth grade, and high school. Um, this is, we're doing the pilot right now. They're going to be available. We hope the first batch of them, five or six of them, in the fall, they'll be hosted on the History Colorado website. And uh, we hope, if we do this right, that they will immediately be something that you can consider using in a classroom. Um, so I'm going to close with those three endorsements. The first is Governor Hickenlooper. He is the guy behind this whole project. He <coughs> called me and my boss and some other people into dinner one day and said, wouldn't it be great if we could find a way to get more Colorado history into classrooms? Uh, would you please work on that, and by the way, there's no budget for this. You have to just figure out <laughs> how to do it. Uh, but it's great because it's, it's not often that we have a governor who understands the value of social studies education. And we want to take advantage of that while we can. Um, governor Hickenlooper's interest in this is that he sees an emphasis on, on Colorado and our social studies lessons as a way to enhance the educational experience of young people by having those local connections, a way to cultivate that sense of community more broadly with Coloradans and a way to, in general, create, in his words, a stronger civic cement that we're all going to benefit from for generations. All right, political endorsement out of the way. I know not everyone is impressed by political endorsements. So I've got some bigger guns. Henry David Thoreau. <laughs> this guy loved primary sources. In the very first chapter of Walden, he says, I should not talk so much about myself if there were anybody else whom I knew as well. You skip down a little bit, and he says, I, on my side, require of every writer, first or last, a simple and sincere account of his own life, and not merely what he has heard of other men's lives. Some such account as he would send to his kindred from a distant land, for if he has lived sincerely, it must have been in a distant land to me. We all know that history is a distant land, and primary sources are that letter from our kindred of the past. And finally, we had a presentation on poetry uh, Thomas Hornsby Farrell was the de facto po poet laureate of Colorado for a good chunk of the 20th century. Uh, and he has this terrific poem that I think more eloquently explains why we should begin uh, in Colorado than I can. I'm just going to read it for you for those who can't see it. Always begin where you are. Always begin right here where you are and work out from here. If adrift, feel the feel of the oar in the oarlock first. If saddling a horse, let your right knee slug the belly of the horse like an uppercut. Then cinch his suck. Then mount and ride away to any dream deserving the sensible world. 
Thank you very much. That's, that's my talk.